We are fewer than 100 days away from the next Ontario election, and that means the parties are all neck deep in creating the platforms they will take to the voters once the writs are drawn up and the campaign officially begins. Platforms can be hugely important in determining whether a party has got game or is laughed out of the game. So how are these campaign documents created and who has the final say about what makes the final cut? Let's find out. And we'll introduce them in order of precedence in the legislature, starting at his office in downtown Toronto. There's Michael Balagas. He is the chief of staff and campaign director to the leader of the official opposition, Andrea Horvath, and he heads up the NDP's platform development group. In Calgary, Alberta, Kate Graham, co-chair of the Liberals' platform committee and the party's candidate in London North Centre. And in Mississauga, Ontario, deputy leader Abhijit Manet, who's co-chair of the Greens' platform committee and the party's candidate in Beaches, East York. And as I welcome everyone to the program, you may notice we have no representative from the progressive conservatives here. And that's because, despite our repeated efforts to secure a representative from that party, the campaign director, Corey Tanaik, simply declined to respond to any of our multiple invitations. I've known Corey for 20 years, and for whatever reason, he simply didn't respond to any of my emails. I guess this is what the kids call being ghosted. So, okay, such is life, and on we go. I'm delighted to have you three here, though. And let's set up this conversation with the following. Um, back in the 1990s, the Liberals came out with something called their Red Book. This is federally, Jean Chrétien, and there's no question it helped them win. The progressive conservatives under Mike Harris in the middle 1990s came out with a common sense revolution. Again, no question it helped them win. Four years ago, Doug Ford's conservatives didn't have a platform at all, and yet they won. So the question, Michael, start us off. Is a platform really all that crucial to a party's electoral success? I mean, I, I think it is. I think it's one of those uh, incredibly important elements, but I would I would sort of underline elements. I mean, it is uh, uh, it's one piece. And I think what's what's important in the in the two documents that you mentioned, uh, in many ways, it was less the specific content in the documents than the direction uh, that the document signaled to the electorate. And that's one of the key pieces uh, of a platform. Uh, uh, I hear a lot of uh, average voters say, I can't make up my mind till I read the platform. And with all due respect, not a lot of average voters read the platforms, but they do take from the platform and how it's analyzed uh, a very, very strong signal about what they can expect in terms of a potential government's values, its priorities, et cetera. So um, important, yes, but one of, the, uh, uh, one of many ingredients that go into uh, helping voters decide uh, which way they're going to go on election day. Kate Graham, how about you? You've spent an awful lot of your life over the last many months putting together the Liberals' <laughs> platform that they will take to the voters in less than 100 days. How important do you think it'll ultimately be and whether the Liberals are successful? So you won't be surprised to hear me say this, but I think it's uh, enormously important. And not just the document, but more importantly is how we got there. So Ontario Liberals, uh, you know, as you know, we got a very clear message from voters in 2018, and we have spent the better part of the last four years listening, reconnecting with people, and uh, really trying to get a sense of what matters to people and appreciating the change realities that a lot of people are living through right now. So that has meant everything from you know, surveys of thousands of people, not just liberals, looking for good ideas. It's meant Zoom calls of a thousand people where we stay on till the last person who wishes to speaks. It's meant a lot of quiet conversations with experts and stakeholders and particular communities. Uh, we are listening and building a platform that I believe will respond to what people are looking for right now. So the platform matters, but uh, you know, where I started and, and I very much believe that the process of getting there, bringing people together, providing a meaningful opportunity for people to speak up about the things that they care about. Uh, that's what politics is supposed to be all about. So building a platform can be this amazing opportunity to give people a chance to have their say and put their fingerprint on a plan that uh, represents you know, a better path forward for us as a province. Abhijit, how about you on that? Yeah, I think uh, the fact that the 2018 election uh, won Doug Ford a victory over something like Buck a Beer was incredibly troubling. But I think it's not um, uh, something as an indicator of what's to come, but I think more so, uh, I think it was a factor about the sheer 
huge anti-incumbency factor that was weighted against the win liberal government. Um, but I think a platform is absolutely crucial because, um, as Michael, uh, uh, as as my uh, panel, fellow panelists pointed out, um, there there are massive um, uh, vision that that you're put forth towards voters about who the uh, party is, what the leadership is like, and what kind of ideas that they're going to be putting forward. Um, and and that is a good uh, that is a good indicator of where that party currently is and uh, what kind of government they do will be forming. For us Greens, like we recognize that we won't be forming the next government. Probably, uh, you know, politics is strange and stranger things have happened. Uh, but uh, we recognize that we want to be a, an important part of a minority government that comes uh, about in 2022 in June. Uh, and what kind of partners will Greens be in that minority government? That's the kind of vision that we put forward. And again, uh, we've also uh, done a massive grassroots campaign of making sure we connect with our stakeholders. Also, just with people on the street, not just with interest groups, but people, real Ontarians, uh, with real issues that, that have been played out throughout this pandemic and even before that. Abhijit, I like the way you said probably because uh, and because I remember covering this <laughs> back in 1919 when the uh, United Farmers of Ontario uh, were so convinced that they had no hope, they didn't even have a leader when they went into that election and they won them majority government. So go figure. Um, probably. <laughs> right. Uh, Kate, I want to circle back, though, to something that uh, that you touched on, because and, and let me set it up this way. I know Lynn McLeod, who was the leader of the Ontario Liberals in the 1990s, is a big political hero of yours. She's the first female ever to lead a major political party in Ontario history. And I well remember, I re actually really did cover her uh, platform kickoff for the 1995 election. And it was as good a document as I'd ever seen. You know, here's what we're going to do if we win in our first 30 days, our next 30 days, the next 30 days after that. It was all lined out, policy prescriptions every step of the way, and she did not win. In fact, you know, Mike Harris handed her a very significant defeat. What lessons do you take from that? Hmm. Uh, that is a very good question, and one that I think we have been really grappling with as we've been rebuilding as a party. You know, as I said earlier, we heard a very clear message in 2018 that we had lost touch, that we had stopped listening to the things that people care about. And so the platform process and also this whole campaign for Ontario Liberals is a chance for us to go back to Ontarians and say, we heard you. You know, we listened to that message. We have spent, as I said, four years trying to understand the issues that matter most to you. And, you know, will a platform win the election? I think it's one ingredient. Uh, we've got a terrific leader. Stephen Deluca is, you know, a thoughtful, smart, reasonable guy who really understands politics. He's a what you see is what you get. You know, he's a family man who understands why politics matters in this province. And so a platform with a leader and then a terrific team of candidates, most of whom are people stepping up for the first time. Um, I think it's a number of ingredients that we will need to be successful in June. But uh, the platform is a big part of it. It's, you know, we want to be clear with Ontarians about here is what we understand matters to you. Uh, should we be given the privilege of governing once again? Here are the things that we would do in the province that would benefit you and your family and your community. So I think it's a really important ingredient for success. Okay. Michael, there may be an assumption that the NDP, when it writes its platform, doesn't bother consulting, let's say, the Ontario Medical Association because the assumption is not very many doctors are going to vote for you, or they don't bother meeting with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce because they assume not too many business people are going to vote for you. Um, I guess, uh, I guess I want you to confirm or deny whether that's the case. Well, I can show you my meeting schedule, which will <clears throat> certainly deny that, that's the, uh, deny that that's the case. I mean, we do always, and this election in particular, I, I want to emphasize, we have reached out um, uh, to every, every element of uh, Ontario society, whether it's business, labor, academia, medical institutions, the two that you highlighted, the... Uh, Ontario Medical Association, the Ontario Chambers of Commerce. We've had extensive discussions with them and um, uh, very fruitful. I mean, they provided us some great advice. Uh, we talked extensively when we came out with our $20 an hour minimum wage policy, by the way. A lot of, our, a lot of platform is already out, uh, I, wanna, I wanna say, and that's one of the pieces. And we had very, very good discussions with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce about how business would implement that, the kind of supports. So we talked to, I think, to, to, to Kate's uh, earlier point, we talked to a whole mass of stakeholders, like literally hundreds of stakeholder meetings that cover the gamut, 
in addition to the thousands of inputs that we get from party members, activists, uh, and, uh, uh, and individual Ontarians. And, you know, the last thing I would say to that, I mean, the, the closer you are uh, to potentially forming a government, and I want to underline potentially forming a government, the more these consultations become much, much more important and much, much more meaningful. And so not only have we gone the extra step to reach out, but these organizations have gone the extra step to reach out to us this time, which is, uh, uh, which is really encouraging and, uh, and a really, really positive development. And I think you'll see reflected in our, uh, uh, in our platform. And Abhijit, let me ask you a similar question, which is you being with the Green Party, the assumption may, many people may have is that you don't bother wasting your time going and talking to the oil and gas industry representatives about what they'd like to see in your platform. Is that true? Yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, <laughs> but but at the same time, we do do make sure that we are uh, an all encompassing um, uh, platform. It's not going to be just focused on environmental pro priorities. Actually, the biggest a focus that we have is actually on creating affordable and livable communities, essentially creating the world that we want, the world that our kids would want. Uh, and again, we have an amazing leader in Mike Schreiner, who's actually been, I think, the most effective opposition leader in this uh, uh, Queen's, Queen's Park current uh, session and has been uh, uh, so pivotal in terms of, you know, making sure that he's working collaboratively uh, with all different uh, uh, parts of uh, government, but also all different stakeholders. Uh, when we released our affordable housing plan, uh, even the uh, Landowners Association uh, said that they approved of it. So we are, we are definitely making sure that we consult all stakeholders in, uh, in diversity of opinions. Um, but our, our our values are still our values, and we're going to and we're going to make sure that we stick with them. Um, and, and in terms of the actual uh, platform itself, um, we have again uh, uh, staked out uh, an enormous amount of people uh, for the for the creation of it. Uh, but but again, uh, oil and gas is something we just don't believe in, and we think that uh, renewables are the future, and so um, that's what's going to be in the platform. Okay, Kate mentioned her leader Stephen Del Duca. You just mentioned Mike. Schreiner, I'm going to preempt uh, Michael Balagas by saying Andrea Thank Horvath you. is the leader of the official opposition. Now, all the leaders have been mentioned. Everybody's done their done their thing. But, um, <laughs> Michael, pick up the story here. Okay, you've been in, out in the field consulting, as you pointed out, with a wide, vast array of groups. You get all the information you want. You've got all the feedback. You've done all that consultation. It all comes, I guess, back to you then to figure out, okay, now what? The information comes back to Queen's Park. How do you decide what goes in, what stays out, et cetera? Well, again, that is a, a, a broader consultation in terms of pulling together initial documents, circling back with stakeholders, caucus members, and others, and then ultimately pulling together what you think is a platform that is really reflective of what you heard and reflective of what people of Ontario are both looking for and need. At, uh, at a particular time. And then it's handed off to, uh, uh, ultimately it's handed off to the leader. And uh, I, I cannot resist but talk about uh, the importance of that. And particularly when you hand it off to a leader who has the experience that someone like Andrea Horvath does, that has the passion, uh, and that has spent a political career standing up for ordinary Ontarians and ordinary folks. And at the end of the day, that is the prism that the uh, that the platform goes through, uh, and then and then is announced. And uh, um, the other piece of it that I think is important is is it also when when folks look at it, they have to believe you can do it. Uh, they have to believe that you can do it, and they have to see themselves in it. So I think those are are, are incredibly important elements that go into the final decision, uh, and that the leader weighs. And uh, um, they are reflective. I mean, with. Um, you know, for example, like we have several pieces of platform out already, and I'll refer to our Green New Democratic Deal, which is our plan to fight climate. And we did spend an incredible amount of time talking to the industry because there are going to be a lot of jobs displaced in the future. We talked to the industry, we talked to the unions who represented those workers, and made sure that they were reflected in the uh, uh, in the final document that we put forward. Uh, so yeah, you do have to go broad, uh, and uh, at the end of the day you will have a platform that reflects the values of the party. And most importantly, at, uh, at election time, when people are looking at leaders, 
and they are going to look at Andrea Horvath compared to Stephen Del Duca, compared to Mike Schreiner. They want to see that leader's values in the platform. Okay, Kate, tell us how it will work for the Liberals if, for example, during the course of your consultations, you have discovered among the grassroots of Liberal supporters, let's just say a real consensus for doing X, Y, and Z. And you then take it to the caucus and the leader and you discover, eh, they're not so hot on X, Y, and Z. They'd frankly rather do A, B, and C. How do you <laughs> resolve that? <laughs> We have not uh, encountered, I would say this whole process has been really rooted in listening and very carefully paying attention to what we hear over and over and over again as being the top priorities. And we've built a decision-making structure that's very responsive to that. Now, at the central level, there are a few things that we've introduced, uh, including an equity lens. So we've recently just, um, we've been organizing our candidates into teams to manage um, particular parts of the platform and meeting with stakeholders and just making sure that we, we've heard them and we've got it right. Uh, but also making sure that, you know, if there are competing ideas and one, you know, provides a greater benefit to people who have, you know, been particularly disadvantaged, for example, through the pandemic, um, making sure that we're prioritizing those ideas. So the process is rooted in listening. It's not a one person holds the final say. It's a really carefully paying attention to what we have heard online in these meetings uh, through our candidates uh, and then also making sure that the things that we're putting forward address the big picture things we know matter to people in Ontario, uh, things like equity, things like addressing climate change and strengthening the systems that people rely on most, like education and healthcare. Okay, let me do a quick follow up with you, because I'm guessing that if if there is overwhelming support by the grassroots to do something and for whatever reason, yep. Stephen Del Duca, your leader says, you know what, I I don't believe in that and I can't campaign on that. He ultimately holds the pen on that, does he not? If he's not on side, I presume it doesn't go on the platform, even if 90% of liberals want it. Is that right? I mean, I, I guess, but I'm not sure what a scenario would be like when you go out and listen to people. You don't have to listen for very long to keep, to hear these patterns, these repeated things. People want an education system that they can trust. People want to know that, you know, if you've got a family member who's waiting on a surgery, that that's going to happen very soon. People with kids in childcare want to know that that agreement is going to get signed. So the things that you hear over and over and over again when you start, you know, once you've talked to, you know, in the tens of thousands of people, uh, become things that, you know, we as a party will champion. And I, and I know other parties, you know, care about those issues too. We need to find opportunities to work together on those things that matter most. So I honestly can't really imagine a scenario where there was such a groundswell for an idea and then at the end of the day we said no, that's the process has been built to be from the ground up listening to people about the things that matter most to them. Understood. Abhijit, let me give you uh, another for instance that may be uh, completely fictitious, but I'm going to try it anyway. And that is, you know, I bet after you consult with uh, the Green Party members and all the stakeholders and so on and so forth, if you put all of the ideas that you heard into your platform, that platform would be 5,000 pages long, and you know you can't have a platform <laughs> that's 5,000 pages long. So, how do you decide what goes in and what you just say to people, you know, that was a great idea, but sorry, it's just not going to make the cut? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so what we've done is actually we're going to be dividing our platform into two parts. One is going to be a vision book that will have a more comprehensive list of ideas that were communicated to us or advocated for. And then one will be more of like the greatest hits sort of, um, you know, like the ones that are going to be front and center. Uh, during the election. Um, and and uh, what goes, and obviously even in more comprehensive documents, there will be some ideas that will be redacted. And I think what we do is we, we base it on uh, uh, two criteria. One is uh, feasibility and, um, and, and in terms of uh, how doable it is. And also in another one is a, a more um, uh, directive idea or principle or uh, something that's more aspirational. Uh, and so that's how we uh, categorize those two things. Um, and um, in terms of our platform, it's going to be fully costed. So we also have to make sure that we set out a budget. So that's also a limiting factor in that in that uh, deliberation. So uh, all those three things, when we uh, compile together, is what creates the final list. Michael, let me circle back to something you said uh, several minutes ago, which is you are quite confident, despite all of the effort that you and others have put into creating the NDP platform, you are quite confident, I bet, that 95% of Ontarians are not going to read it. And I wonder how frustrating or how irritating it is for you and your colleagues to spend so much effort on a document that you know so few are ultimately going to see. 
Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think it's frustrating at all. Um, I think that there's a large number of Ontarians will look at parts of the platform, uh, particularly stakeholders. They want to see themselves in the platform. They want to know that their ideas are represented, et cetera. You know? For example, uh, electoral reform, I'll use that as an example. I, I would argue that 90 odd percent of Ontarians have no idea when we start talking about electoral reform what we're talking about, nor are they going to base their vote on it. But there are Ontarians that this is an incredibly important piece of, 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 uh, of their deliberation and their thought, and they're going to look. And they want to see that, that their ideas, they're reflective. And some people will make their decision on it. I mean, there's people looking now at the, uh, at the kind of electoral reform that Stephen Del Duca proposed uh, versus what we're proposing. There's campaigns underway already in terms of, uh, um, uh, with due respect to Kate, in terms of what's wrong with the Liberal proposal and what's good with the NDP proposal. So those things happen. It's a small group, but it's important that they're there and it's important that they see themselves. The challenge for us, for the rest of Ontarians, what they want to know is they want to know what are your priorities, are they my priorities, and can you deliver on them? So we, you know, to, to your point, Steve, we put out our platform very easy, we, uh, very early. Uh, it'll come out pre-election. I don't think that's any big surprise for folks. It came out pre-election last time because we want those folks to see themselves, to find themselves in the platform and have time to think about it. We've already put out a major piece on... Um, uh, seniors reform, how we reform seniors care in this province coming out of the pandemic. We've already put out a major piece on housing and we've already put out a major piece on climate. So this stuff is out early and it's out that people can see it. And I accept that the average person who's worried about, I got to pay my rent, my kid's school is falling apart and I'm not that secure in my job. Those are the things that they want to make sure they're hearing us talk about front and center during the election. So once the closer you get to the election, the more you start focusing in on those priorities and being able to say to people, we, have, we understand you, we are with you, and we have a doable, affordable plan to get it done. Kate, we have seen campaigns in this province and frankly nationally as well fail and leaders really badly embarrassed because the people who put together the platform uh, frankly screwed up. You know, they got the math wrong on something or they didn't see that this program would actually cost five times as much as what they initially anticipated, that kind of thing. How much pressure do you feel right now <laughs> on yourself and your team not to screw this up? <laughs> what kind of a question is that, Steve? <laughs> I, I mean, before you asked the question, uh, I was feeling quite good, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, Honestly, it has been a, a great team effort and, you know, we are not in the position that we were in in 2018, you know, being a party that has been in power for 15 years, it was a different kind of process. This has been very grassroots, uh, very much a volunteer run effort. Uh, we've got candidates all across the province actively working on this. I feel full confidence uh, in our team. We have some incredibly talented people who've stepped up to help us build the platform. Uh, people who've been connected to the party for a long time and you know are, are really working very hard to put forward a platform that we can be proud of so yeah i'm truthfully uh, not feeling much pressure at all i'm more just very excited we've been making platform announcements just as the other parties have uh, throughout um, over the last two years i guess every two weeks or so we've put something out and the reaction has been very good you know our back to school plan was costed down to the school board level and the reaction has been very good on these things so i'm feeling a lot of confidence and frankly just excitement i'm ready to see the finish line of this and i think we've got a lot of ideas that have come from ontarians that ontarians can get really excited about as we head towards june the second michael i guess i should ask you that one too because the ndp currently has the second highest number of seats they've ever had as a party uh they are the official opposition traditionally ontarians if they're looking for an alternative look to the official opposition but that puts a lot of pressure on you and your team not to make sure there's, or to make sure rather, that there's no screw ups in the platform. How much pressure are you feeling? Um, I wouldn't describe it as pressure, but I would describe it as an added layer of responsibility. I mean, when you are running for government and uh, when people see you uh, increasingly as a government, um, in, the, the level of scrutiny rightfully uh, increases. And so, you know, we want to be as, uh, uh, as transparent as we can, we'll obviously be as accurate as you can. And this will be a tough one. Uh, I'll, I'll put this marker out and uh, I, I think all of our colleagues, uh, my colleagues will agree. 
given the pandemic, given the um, the uh, where we are in a fiscal situation, things changing rapidly, trying to project uh, where you're going to be in a in a fiscal sense four years from now. I mean, the Department of Finance and the and the government can't do it. I mean, I think they were uh, what twelve billion dollars off on their last quarter or something, but. It is going to be incredibly challenging, and I think people have to be honest with the voters when they talk about that. I think you have to give them some sense of what the things you're uh, promising are going to cost, and you have to give them some sense of where that revenue is going to come from. Uh, but it, uh, I think those are the, the kind of big questions. Uh, it's really difficult uh, to drill down every nickel and dime with the kind of uncertainty that we're seeing. Um, uh, and that uncertainty is increasing with events in Europe, et cetera. I mean, it is a, an extremely volatile time, but the values are important. And for us to be able to say, here's how we're going to pay for this. You're not, we're not going to increase low middle income taxes, but the people who benefited and profited, the corporations who benefited and profited from the pandemic, yes, that is a source of revenue that we're going to take advantage of. So I think making those kind of very, very clear statements from people so they understand going into the campaign uh, that uh, that is uh, that, that is what they can expect. Okay, in our last minute here, Michael's already told us that the NDP will bring out its platform before the election campaign actually begins. Uh, Abhijit, how about to you? What are the discussions like right now in terms of when the NDP, excuse me, when the Greens would bring their platform out? Yeah, so we've already started uh, putting out quite a few different papers. Uh, uh, last year, uh, we put out our affordable housing paper, which almost all media uh, outlets, including TVO, call a masterclass. Uh, and, um, we also put out our climate uh, action uh, plan as well. Um, and soon we'll be releasing our uh, mental health care uh, uh, and as well, so putting those uh, uh, massive documents out in, in small pieces, and and we absolutely will have the platform ready before the election. But again, the underscoring points of that platform will be uh, making affordable and livable communities and creating the world we want with the leadership that we need, which we already have. That is Mike Schreiner. Okay, Kate, uh, I, I well remember it, uh, it was in 1994, a year before the next election, that Mike Harris brought out the Common Sense Revolution. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Aaron O'Toole in the last federal election brought out the platform for the Conservative Party on day two of the campaign. Um, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. When are the Liberals going to bring out theirs? Sure. Well, similar to what you've heard from the others, uh, we have been releasing platform pieces steadily every couple of weeks uh, over more than a year. But, uh, you know, for the election, people will be able to see it all put together, and we're really excited to release the platform as a whole. I do not want to make it sound uh, done quite yet, though. You know, as we are sitting here, there is still time. So if you are listening to this and you've got a big idea or something that you want to see, uh, be a part of our platform, be a part of this election ahead, this is your chance. You know, this is one of the ways that we as citizens get to shape the province that we live in. So, you know, we've made a lot of progress and we are getting very close. But if you're hearing this and you are interested in sharing your big idea with us, uh, the door remains open until we get to the election campaign. So we're getting very close, uh, but there's still space for people to contribute and have their say if that's something of interest. Okay. Sheldon, can I have a three shot? Perfect. That's exactly right. Here's the last question. Anybody want to share the catchy name they're using for their platform with us right now? <laughs> I'm seeing a no. lot of smiles, but no takers. Okay, that's what I kind of figured. Uh, from left to right on your screen, Kate Graham, Abhijit Manet, Michael Balagas, really good of all three of you to join us here on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.